Hi, everyone. Um, for those, I know, God, I think I know most everyone in the room, but for those I don't, I'm Eric Fredrickson. I'm Associate Vice President for Online Learning here at the University of Rochester, and I'm also Associate Professor here in our School of Education. Um, and I want to thank you for all joining us for lunch today. Um, and I've got a couple words um, to start with, um, and probably most importantly, it's just an honor to welcome um, my uh, good friend Bobby Bell to the University of Rochester. Um, Bob is the Vice Dean of Online Learning for the Tandon School of Engineering at NYU. Um, that is a new uh, name because, uh, and Bob may mention this, but uh, School of Engineering um, was recently renamed after a $100 million gift, okay? Which is great news, um, of course. Um, so congratulations on that. Um, Bob is a product of Brooklyn College. He's had a, a terrific career, first in publishing and second in online education. I'll go off script here for a second and say it's always interesting when you've known someone for so long and then you sort of get ready to do an introduction and you sort of start digging and you find out sort of additional, you know, sort of bits um, that I didn't know along the way. Um, one is actually that Bob has his own Wikipedia page, which was a source for some of that. So I was, that's, that was impressive right there too. Um, I would tell you, I've had the, I'm not guilty. <laughs> you didn't do it. <laughs> I guess that's the way that works, right? Um, I've had the distinct pleasure of working with Bob over the past probably 16 or 17 years through our, our efforts with the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation. Uh, we've served together on the board of directors for the what was the Sloan Consortium for many years. It's been recently renamed the Online Learning Consortium, um, and so we've had that opportunity. Bob is, uh, is also a Sloan Fellow. His online programs have won multiple national awards, um, and so there's just a great career there. Um, but most importantly, um, you know, in addition to being a very smart and insightful uh, person, Bob is also a really good guy and a good person, and so um, I'm just delighted that he was willing to come up and and talk to us today. I think one of the, um, the great aspects of higher education is the sort of collaboration and sharing that can happen across um, our great universities. And so in that spirit, um, you know, uh, the University of Rochester, Rochester certainly respects and values the good work at NYU, and I'm just really grateful that Bob is here to share with us an overview of those initiatives. So with that, um, let's welcome Bob. Thanks a lot. It's uh, really great to be here. I, I'm going to go back and forth. The, the um, podium often has uh, more interruption than a, uh, a way of uh, being close to the people who are here. I'm really delighted to be here. This is my first time in um, Rochester. I am in Rochester. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and. Uh, Eric was kind enough to give me a tour of the campus. It's beautiful. Uh, the uh, older buildings, as well as the uh, more innovative, newer buildings, are really incredible. Some of them uh, are uh, very uh, advanced in uh, the way in which they deal with uh, technology and deal with space. And I think uh, that whole uh, ambience of the, of the new and the old is great. And I think uh, one of the things that uh, uh, makes online learning uh, so interesting is that uh, it, uh, it deals with uh, the uh, more advanced technologies as well as the more advanced um, pedagogical approaches that uh, make it interesting and uh, innovative. And so I think uh, part of what uh, uh, has made my career with uh, Eric and our colleagues so interesting and so fascinating is to learn about uh, the way in which uh, digital education has uh, adopted some of the most progressive forms of education that uh, uh, people are uh, ha have been urging um, professors and uh, teachers all over the world to be able to accommodate and use. So with that, I'm going to go through the slides. Uh, uh, th this slide uh, is essentially uh, something that uh, Eric asked me to uh, explain. Uh, 
uh, how NYU itself as an institution, this is all the schools under the uh, uh, president's and dean's umbrella, how they've organized themselves in response to online learning. Uh, online learning is not, has not been natural to NYU. Uh, it, uh, it, it uh, prides itself, NYU, as being an um, urban campus with uh, lots of schools and lots of uh, uh, different silos, uh, as many universities are. And there was, uh, for a long time, no central theme uh, to migrate uh, classes into, into online learning. Uh, there was no um, uh, central um, fiat from the top uh, that online learning should be this way or, and go in that direction. Uh, but uh, the uh, administration, the, the faculty, organized these three different groups. Uh, one is the Teaching Technology Committee, which has on it uh, representatives from all the schools and from uh, IT and from uh, uh, the registrar's office and uh, other pieces of the university uh, that have to talk to each other about uh, what online learning entails. I serve on it uh, as part of the engineering school and um, it, um, it is sort of the, uh, an umbrella organization that uh, looks at what's needed uh, finances sometimes uh, by recommending financial uh, encouragement for online learning to the uh, to the provost and to the president to other bodies that <coughs> make decisions on financial ends uh, but it also talks a lot about uh, how the university might be going in various directions in terms of online learning so uh, it has subcommittees uh, maybe four or five subcommittees that uh, deal with various things so it, 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 there is a, a kind of a structure at NYU that thinks about these things. Uh, I don't know how deeply they think about them. I serve on that committee. So I know, you know, when you serve on big committees, uh, you get the feeling that uh, things are happening, but it's not in this committee. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, 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 because you never get to vote on anything. Uh, you never get to approve anything. You just sort of nod your head and uh, <laughs> Uh, next week you find out that that was the budget. So uh, I, mean, I, I like being on the committee because you learn about things, uh, but I, I don't know where the, uh, the, the structure of, that, uh, of, the, of the school, how it, how it moves uh, in, in any direction, uh, other than probably the provost and the president and maybe uh, uh, senior faculty. So this is a structure that exists, it's not bad, uh, it does uh, announce itself and has a, a website, and you can go on the website and see all the decisions it's made. So it looks like fairly uh, transparent, uh, but I'm on it, and it's not transparent entirely to me. Uh, there's also the Faculty Committee on Future of Tech Enhanced Education, and that, uh, I don't sit on that, but that is a, uh, strictly a faculty committee where people from various uh, uh, schools uh, usually uh, uh, more senior faculty who have uh, thought about education and thought about research and other kinds of things very deeply, and they, uh, they talk about uh, how the university might proceed uh, with online learning, and they issue reports. There's a, if you go on the website uh, and you look, type in Faculty Committee on the Future of uh, Tech Enhanced Education, uh, you'll see a whole bunch of reports on where they think the university might go. And then, of course, there's the trustees, and they have an online uh, education and technology committee. And in many respects, they're very much like a lot of uh, what's going on in education today, uh, especially uh, conservative schools uh, that are uh, uh, not sure where they want to go in online education. And frequently, the uh, trustees are usually um, composed of lots of people in uh, industry and uh, who are uh, more antsy about online learning and more want things to happen more quickly. Uh, you've probably heard about boards of trustees who's, who fired presidents and then rehired them uh, because they did or didn't do things on online learning. Uh, and this particular committee, um, the, uh, the trustees committee, uh, is, um, is, a, is a more progressive, at least uh, it's so it thinks, 
uh, in uh, urging the school to be more innovative and more uh, aggressive in going ahead with online learning. And I, I've given a couple of talks to them, and uh, the, they're usually very bullish about what my group is doing, and usually very uh, sour about the rest of the university that's not moving uh, in uh, a more um, uh, speedy direction. Uh, so that's more or less uh, what's at the top. In fact, uh, uh, when you go down to uh, the actual uh, activity that goes on at, at the it's more grassroots. Uh, this is the, uh, the umbrella and the structure and, and all those kinds of things. But what actually happens in online learning happens at the school level. And I'm going to show you uh, the different programs. Uh, these are the programs that now exist uh, at the various schools that have online programs. Some of them are in formation. Uh, if you look at the School of Professional Studies, uh, those are uh, very much like uh, uh, any school that has um, uh, programs that are for the public. Uh, many of these are not uh, advanced degree programs, although some of them are uh, bachelor's degrees and, and master's degrees. Uh, they're mostly designed for professionals uh, and not for academic standing. Uh, and they are, as you can see, uh, uh, the ones that have uh, the most activity. Um, not on this list is the engineering school, and I'm going to show you that later. Uh, the, uh, the others. Um, School of Law, as you may know, uh, uh, the um, accrediting body for the law uh, degrees are not, uh, do not allow online learning as a, as a doctoral degree in law or the other, or an LLD or all the other. They do allow some uh, minor degrees in online learning, and you can see some of them there. Uh, these are mostly uh, video streamed. Uh, courses, the ones in law, where uh, a, a lecturer gets up, uh, gives a lecture, and there's very little um, uh, uh, student interaction by remote students. Uh, uh, it's, I don't know if you've um, seen Coursera courses or courses that are done um, by um, uh, the Harvard uh, MIT consortium. Uh, the, the, the ones that are done by the law school are pretty much uh, like the ones that you see uh, on the internet for free. Although I'm sure the, the, the uh, tuition at the law school is uh, a little bit higher. Um, the, uh, the programs at the uh, Stern School are essentially not, not essentially online uh, particularly. They are um, um, low uh, uh, residency programs all over the world. They're in Paris and in uh, Shanghai and elsewhere. And students take courses at different locations around the world and the, at the Stern School, which is the, the School of Business. And then in between those low residency um, experiences, they do some of their work online. So that's a, a different model. Uh, and um, the, the uh, Steinhardt School, which is uh, uh, the edu education school, like uh, very close to this school in terms of what it offers, uh, but it has a lot of different op options, including music. Uh, and uh, the ones that, they're, uh, that you see here, uh, MA in teaching, speech therapy, and so on, these are being done uh, in conjunction with um, vendors. Uh, there are two uh, major vendors in the online learning space now. One is uh, 2U and the other is Hot Talk. And uh, these two vendors, um, uh, while they don't provide the curriculum and they don't provide the teaching, they provide all the rest of what goes into online learning, that is recruitment, um, marketing, infrastructure, uh, and uh, whatever else it takes uh, apart from uh, teaching and uh, curriculum to make an online learning uh, program effective. Uh, and they also, uh, this is a new uh, approach to online learning in, uh, that has just emerged, let's say, in the last few years, where they also invest 
uh, in the programs that they are developing for the schools and uh, provide the uh, uh, investment capital that's necessary to go forward. And the, uh, the school then, from the revenue that's generated, uh, returns that investment over time uh, to, to you and to um, Hot Chalk. Um, we talked to the, both those um, organizations, and uh, we were very impressed with both of them and how they uh, uh, deliver the courses and how they market the courses and uh, other activities that they're engaged in. Uh, but we eventually, uh, my group, the engineering group, decided not to uh, proceed with either of them uh, because of the, uh, uh, for, for various reasons, but one of the critical reasons was uh, the investment structure was not conducive uh, to what we, we were comfortable with. Uh, we, uh, our program uh, generates a significant amount of revenue for the school, and in order to uh, uh, follow the approach that TUYU and Hotch Hawk uh, provided, we would have to um, uh, return a significant amount of our investment, uh, of our revenue, to them. And so the, the um, it didn't seem uh, appropriate for us, while other, you know, the, obviously it, it seemed appropriate for uh, Steinhardt and for the University of California uh, and for a lot of other schools uh, have um, uh, joined forces with them, collaborated with them. Uh, but for us, it didn't seem the, the right approach to take. And uh, uh, I believe, uh, Eric, you've also talked to both of them. Uh, and. Uh, uh, probably decided not to go forward with uh, a relationship with them. Uh, uh, you know, uh, online learning is, it seems new, it's, it's, but it's uh, probably two decades old. But every, every time you turn around, there's something new that uh, confounds you or surprises you or uh, you embrace uh, for some reason. Uh, I won't go into the others unless somebody has some questions about the other uh, programs that I'm listing. Uh, that, that should sort of give you a, a broad picture uh, of what's going on. I, I, I should say that in addition to these programs, uh, uh, at NYU and generally at the other schools, uh, faculty who want to go online and teach online uh, outside of um, degree programs are free to do that with the approval of their uh, colleagues. At, uh, at the School of Engineering, we do not have that uh, option. We believe that uh, independent, uh, uh, autonomous uh, courses that are random and not tied to degrees um, have problems uh, uh, with enrollment and other kinds of issues and with marketing and so on. And so we at the School of Engineering uh, uh, believe that if you, uh, as a faculty member, want to go online, <laughs> Uh, it, it, it must be part of a, uh, a degree program. Uh, this slide is essentially uh, to talk about the $100 million. Uh, uh, last, uh, two weeks ago we were uh, poly, and now we're Tandon. Uh, and, uh, and it's uh, actually a, a really great thing. Uh, uh, poly uh, fell in hard times uh, a decade ago. Uh, the, for a variety of reasons, and uh, it was uh, important for Polly to um, uh, find a home where uh, investments could be made in laboratories and in, uh, uh, and in uh, scholarship and other kinds of things. And so, uh, and NYU years ago had abandoned its own engineering school uh, up in the Bronx. Uh, and uh, so uh, a marriage was made about five years ago. The official, uh, uh, I think it was a uh, marriage of convenience first, and then an actual marriage uh, that, uh, that happened just this year, and, uh, actually last year, and uh, whereas NYU had abandoned its engineering school and, uh, and Poly needed uh, to be part of a comprehensive university, uh, it, uh, it, it, was a, it turned out to be a really good thing. And, um, it, it, and so uh, now uh, the Poly uh, became part of NYU, and uh, the, the new dean, uh, Srinivasan, uh, 
uh, when he took over uh, the position two, uh, three years ago, uh, recognized that uh, in order for uh, Pali to make its next move and to move forward, uh, it needed money. And so uh, the Tandon uh, family uh, stood up to the call. And so uh, uh, I think uh, uh, very luckily, very um, uh, graciously, and very importantly, uh, the Tandon School has a, f a tremendous future being part of NYU, as well as uh, having uh, significant resources to move forward. Uh, what I'm going to show you now is how um, uh, we organize ourselves. Uh, what you see uh, in the top box is um, uh, the engineering school dean, uh, academic department chairs, and uh, myself uh, are the leadership. And uh, it is uh, a combination of things that we do together as a team uh, that identify uh, programs and, and, and uh, ways of uh, operating uh, that are at the, uh, at the apex of what we do. We also have, uh, as part of that, an online corporate sales uh, activity that I'll show you uh, later, where we uh, provide uh, Fortune 500 co companies uh, with um, some of our programs to, for their employees. Uh, Eric um, sits on the um, our external board uh, that is involved with um, uh, identifying corporations and programs that are useful to industry. Um, uh, on on the, uh, th th this next box is essentially our online student services uh, group, uh, and I'll make, I'm going to make a point of that soon, uh, and uh, it shows you uh, the kinds of people who are involved in, uh, on the student side, and then uh, uh, as you see on the right, the, the kinds of people that we have on our staff that are involved with faculty support and course development. Uh, these um, uh, various elements uh, are, um, are what we think essential ingredients to having a robust online learning program. For many schools and for many ways of thinking, uh, it's developing the, the courses and delivering the courses that is uh, essentially sufficient to have an online learning program. Uh, but in, in years of experience at uh, Stevens, where I was before, and uh, uh, here at NYU, uh, we believe that the uh, online learning student services is uh, as important and as essential to a quality online learning program as uh, the online support for faculty and the curriculum. Um, the, um, uh, as you can imagine, uh, students, uh, remote students, uh, are not on campus. Uh, they, uh, they can feel alienated. Uh, they, don't, they can feel uh, at a distance from uh, what is going on in the department, what's going on in the school, from the research, from all of the things that uh, matter to uh, students in a, in a university. And so um, unless a university has uh, introduced a, a team of people uh, on staff who think about that on a daily basis, about uh, how to engage students, how to uh, embrace them, how to alert them, how to make them feel um, as comfortable on, online as as students do on campus. And so uh, uh, these, uh, these, uh, the staff uh, is in, uh, in almost daily contact with our students about uh, uh, problems that may face them in, in, um, in, in their studies, about problems that may face them with uh, financing their uh, education, uh, about uh, filling out forms, about doing all the kinds of things that a student can do on campus by just going down to the office and speaking to somebody. But that's impossible for someone who's at home or working. So we have to have, uh, if you are really serious about online education, you have to have an infrastructure that uh, is dedicated to the student experience in a very uh, ecological way. Not just the student experience in class, but the student experience uh, 
at, as a university student and what all of that entails. Uh, whereas you, whereas uh, it's very unhelpful to, uh, for a, uh, uh, a bureaucrat sitting in an office uh, to tell a remote student, oh, come in next week and uh, you, you'll find out what to do. Uh, that student may be 4,000 miles away and uh, not uh, capable of coming in next week. So, um, and th that's why I think this slide um, uh, has merit uh, uh, because um, uh, it shows that uh, we're taking the student as seriously as we are the content of the course and as seriously as we do uh, the faculty support services that, that are necessary. Um, we do have a, a relationship with the, the rest of the campus, with IT, because we don't run our own uh, uh, learning management system, and we don't run, run a lot of the, uh, the wires and connections that are necessary for online learning, and do, we do rely on the university at, at large. And uh, we do rely on student workers because uh, not only do they have um, a uh, sometimes more sophistication about uh, the technology that's used in online learning, we learn a great deal from, uh, from their uh, daily uh, connection to uh, uh, the media and to uh, how um, they wish to learn and how they uh, are uh, uh, expect to learn, but also uh, they give us insight into uh, how uh, our own students online might, might feel and how they might be uh, uh, better supported. So uh, student, while we exploit them, of course, uh, uh, we'd like to exploit their minds as well as their uh, abilities uh, on campus. And so uh, that's sort of the uh, infrastructure that we've put together and, and we're very proud of it. Uh, then there's the issue of um, how uh, uh, our courses are approved uh, for to New York State. And this shows the, the trajectory. I think it's very close to what you would probably find uh, for on-campus uh, approvals of courses. Uh, the academic chair has to be uh, a, a champion of what's going on in the department. Uh, by the way, uh, my, my team has nothing to do with this except, except to be uh, uh, a, um, you know, on the sidelines helping where necessary to fill in the gaps uh, 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 technically or, um, or bureaucratically. But uh, from our perspective, all of the programs, uh, intellectually, curriculum-wise, uh, faculty are all uh, out of the, the academic departments. Uh, even though we have that infrastructure, uh, we're the uh, support team rather than a, uh, a, a group that uh, worries about um, uh, the, the content, the curriculum, and, uh, and other matters that are critical to an important uh, and uh, useful uh, degree. So it comes out of the academic department chair, uh, the faculty vote and discuss. Uh, the, eventually it goes up to the dean who uh, blesses it, and then there is a uh, uh, a curriculum overriding committee at the school that has to approve it. And then because uh, we're part of a, a larger organization, it, it used to be that we went right from that committee to the state. And now uh, the NYU uh, curriculum committee has to intervene and, uh, and bless it, and then goes to New York State to, for approval. Um, uh, lately, uh, there have been some changes at the New York State. Uh, Eric and I uh, serve on the advisory committee to the New York State uh, Board of Regents on online learning. And um, uh, they've been uh, asking us uh, uh, how online learning uh, approvals might uh, be accelerated or, uh, or improved. And um, uh, there's been some changes uh, nationally as well. And um, uh, New York State approval, uh, for those who are interested in going forward with uh, online learning uh, programs uh, with state approval uh, is not an easy thing, uh, especially in uh, engineering and other programs that have uh, other uh, oversight boards at the state that uh, uh, 
make it difficult for uh, programs to be approved by the state. Uh, one program that we had uh, took about three years to be approved, whereas other uh, programs uh, that you bring up to the state uh, might take uh, six months. Uh, we're now involved with two programs in engineering that are uh, struggling with uh, responding to questions uh, by the state uh, after seven months of uh, not hearing from them. So uh, uh, while um, uh, online learning now has had a 20-year a, a history, uh, it often feels like it's just getting born. Uh, especially at the state. Um, the, um, at, our, at the school level, we have three boards uh, that uh, review everything that we do. Uh, we have an online learning oversight committee, which is an internal committee, which is, uh, has representatives from every department that has a program online, as well as the dean who chairs it. And uh, things like uh, uh, faculty compensation, um, uh, the structure of courses, uh, how courses ought to be delivered, um, uh, policies with respect uh, to online versus on campus, uh, a whole variety of questions are, co are, uh, are covered by that committee. And it's, it's probably one of the most serious um, uh, committees at, at uh, our, our school that really goes into the weeds and uh, asks serious questions about the quality and uh, assurance to the school that what's going on in, those, in our online classes uh, is uh, responsible and useful for uh, the education. It's, it's not taken lightly. Uh, Eric serves on an external committee, the Enterprise Learning Board that I mentioned before, and that has to do with um, uh, our relationship with, with Fortune 500 companies and others, and uh, with uh, our uh, face to the world uh, outside of the school. And then there's a uh, faculty committee that's pretty much like the Online Learning Oversight Committee that deals with non-credit programs. We don't have very many. Uh, uh, one of the ones that uh, we do have is a, uh, an alliance with Scientific American where we provide online courses to Scientific American uh, readers and subscribers in uh, STEM fields. Uh, these are the programs that we have uh, in, at, the, at the engineering school. Um, uh, as you can see, there are master's degrees. Uh, there are what we call three course immersion certificates. We have a, a couple of graduate certificates, by the way, uh, I don't know what's happening uh, here uh, at uh, Rochester, but increasingly, or decreasingly, I should say, there's less interest uh, among our uh, constituency, our students, in, in uh, graduate certificates. Uh, the, we've seen uh, a falling away, uh, not only online, but on campus, of students interested in graduate certificates as a partial degree. Most uh, students now want to, if they're getting, uh, if they're entering uh, a field in a master's program, they want the master's degree. They don't want a, a mini uh, a degree. Uh, however, we did, somewhere between here and there, uh, we did discover that um, uh, in some fields, like cybersecurity or in um, a data science, uh, for people already in the field, uh, maybe, or people who are, want to move from one field to the other and already have a degree, even a PhD or a master's degree, uh, they need uh, to what they call, it's a word I hate, upskill themselves, uh, and they need to find out uh, new things about a field. And so um, uh, we have invented these things. These are rel relatively new. Uh, we don't know how successful they, they are, but what they are is essentially courses that we've plucked from the master's degree and repurpose them uh, to give um, mid-career people the ability uh, to uh, re-educate themselves in a, in a quick way. They take about a year, one course each semester, over three semesters. Uh, we have a summer semester, so uh, you, can comp you can complete a three-course uh, uh, immersion certificate in a year. Uh, we are now uh, in the midst of uh, exploring an undergraduate degree in, um, 
uh, computer science. Uh, we, this summer, uh, we had a pilot of three courses. And actually, um, uh, Eric is uh, involved in uh, exploring the benefits of that, uh, assessing uh, the student experience uh, to see whether undergraduates uh, have the capacity and the stick to and the eagerness uh, to have, be remote and actually uh, do well in an undergraduate degree, especially in computer science. And this uh, program will be an elite, it, it's, it's uh, a um, honors program. Uh, we think it's the first uh, online honors program in the country. And people will be admitted uh, who are uh, highly capable of, of uh, uh, completing their undergraduate degree in that program. Uh, it's a, an experiment, uh, and uh, Eric and others are urging us to move forward, and uh, we hope it will succeed. So uh, more on that uh, probably in another year or two. Uh, I did mention that we do some non-credit programs. Uh, we are uh, uh, with Scientific American over two years now. We have maybe 40 or 50 courses uh, that we deliver uh, to Scientific American readers and uh, subscribers. Uh, it's, they usually run about a week, uh, about an hour or two a day. And the final ra uh, sort of capstone of that is a discussion with all of the participants on Friday. And they uh, speak um, uh, with the faculty member in a webinar in real time. Uh, the first four um, days uh, of this course is, uh, is uh, uh, a canned experience where you go online and you uh, look at the materials and you may interact with your uh, other students in your class, with your peers. But on Friday, the faculty member wraps it all up and a discussion is held often o over a two-hour two uh, <coughs> period uh, to... Uh, to see whether everyone in the class has uh, absorbed the material and whether there's uh, more interest in this program to go on to, to the next. Uh, right now, uh, you may have heard of Coursera, uh, many of you. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, for a while, um, uh, I was opposed uh, to uh, any involvement with MOOCs uh, because I, um, I felt, uh, for a variety of reasons, that um, uh, MOOCs were counterintuitive to, the, to uh, education, that they were simply, um, to, the, to quality education, that they were simply uh, streaming uh, lectures. And as we know, uh, lectures are not the most um, advanced form of education. And uh, so uh, on that scale alone, I was uh, uh, not a, not a proponent of us uh, working with Coursera and uh, entering that arena. I was also worried uh, that uh, our brand, uh, NYU, would fall under the Coursera brand and that um, uh, like uh, a small mom and pop shop on Amazon, uh, everybody forgets uh, what the mom and pop shop uh, that they bought it from, but they do remember that they bought it on Amazon. So I was afraid that uh, uh, going on to Coursera uh, would give us the same uh, experience, that we would uh, lose um, the, uh, the student experience as an NYU student, and they would become a Coursera student. However, uh, Eric uh, did a lot of research uh, at the Coursera uh, uh, experience that you've had here. And uh, a lot of the research persuaded me uh, that uh, it, it might be useful for us to engage with Coursera. Uh, the, the branding issue appear, appears to be my imagination and not reality, uh, that uh, most uh, students do understand that they're here in some way at, uh, at um, Rochester if they take a Coursera course and not uh, at some uh, uh, mysterious campus called Coursera. And um, uh, they, that uh, the ability to reach out to tens of thousands of people, uh, potential students and, and potential uh, just uh, interested parties all over the world, uh, where uh, you know, routinely uh, our 
advertising and activities take us to maybe um, tens of students. Uh, we may enroll uh, over time uh, in, a, in a program hundreds, uh, never thousands, and certainly not hundreds of thousands. So the whole uh, scale of being involved in the world uh, through uh, MOOCs uh, uh, persuaded me that uh, we might do well uh, to, uh, to take a look at Coursera. And the most I important uh, feature of why we went to Coursera was that the, the dean, the Srinivasan, uh, said, we're going to do it. <laughs> so, so that was the most persuasive. Uh, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, I, I went off to, um, uh, uh, to, to lunch with him. And at the end of lunch, we talked about other things. And I came back to the campus. And uh, uh, Srini said uh, to me, uh, do you really believe in this? I mean, you want to do this? Uh, I said, if, if, I, if I didn't believe in it, I would tell you. He was so relieved that I was just not uh, sucking up and uh, being a good, uh, uh, a good sergeant uh, to his colonel. So, uh, and I, do, I, do, I, I did go through a transformation, and I do believe in it. We're now negotiating with Coursera uh, for a four-course uh, certificate program uh, that we will introduce this spring in cybersecurity. Uh, this shows a little bit of uh, our uh, enrollment uh, statistics. Uh, over the last uh, 10 years, we've enrolled uh, uh, over 10,000 um, students in our online programs. And as you can see, uh, the trajectory is very good. There's an average of 15 to 20 percent enrollment increases over the time. And uh, we're very happy with this. And, and it looks like the, um, uh, the uh, the trajectory is even moving uh, faster. And uh, this is just for a, a very limited number of, uh, of programs, by the way. As you saw before, we only have 10 uh, degrees. And uh, over the next uh, year or two, uh, we're doubling the number of degrees that we're going to offer. So uh, this trajectory, which is now at uh, 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 10,000 and so, we'll probably have in the next few years uh, 20,000 uh, uh, very rapidly. Yes, please. Can you clarify these numbers a little bit? Is this the number of um, students? Enrollments. In Enrollments in courses, so not I'm, students. If I'm a student, I take three courses. Yes. So I contribute yes. three to yes. that? Yes, yes, okay. <clears throat> yes. Yes, please. Well, what percentage of these students are, are online? Uh, these enrollments, I should say. They're all online. All online, 100%. Yes. yes. There's no way to class. Oh, there, um, uh, some students do mix and match. Okay. Uh, uh, about uh, a third of our students can go, are local, so they can go on campus. But these are only online students. Uh, these are only online enrollments. They, they don't show uh, enrollments of those students who do mix and match what their enrollments are like. Gotcha. Yes. There is a quick increase from 2000 to 2000. What could have been rated? That's when I joined. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, that's not true. <laughs> I joined six years ago. So when I was six years ago, you, you, can, you can see a, a little bit of a, of a jump. Uh, this is very different from uh, uh, what you've been experiencing uh, with your own here at Rochester, with your Coursera. Uh, we have very limited number of uh, international students online. And we believe the case, the reason why is that, is that international students prefer to be here physically. That's why they come to Rochester and NYU and other schools. Uh, to have uh, the, uh, the on-campus, the physical experience, uh, the cultural experience of participating in, an, in, an, in a residential uh, university. Whereas, uh, so that uh, online doesn't provide international students with uh, the kind of thing they're looking for. 
uh, and so um, we're thinking of other ways uh, of appealing to international students and uh, we'll uh, when, when I give my next talk in a couple of years I'll, I'll, I'll see whether we can uh, bump up the international uh, numbers uh, but one of the things that's uh, I think useful about this is that only about a quarter of our students are local. Uh, and so, uh, and that's very unusual for online. Uh, if you look at most schools data, half or more of their students are usually local uh, who are online because they know that school. It's usually a, an effect of uh, uh, being uh, in, the, in the area, knowing that school, and being comfortable with that school's name and reputation and brand, rather than going uh, somewhere else. So we're very happy uh, with this number, because we feel that our online program has appealed almost uh, three quarters uh, to people uh, elsewhere, outside, who, who don't know us. So we're very, we're very happy that we've drawn uh, a new um, and different um, student population to the online learning that would be on campus. Uh, uh, this is um, just a, a go, a go through this very quickly. It actually uh, replicates some of the things I, I said in, in that uh, thing with all of the boxes and all of the images of uh, what we do for online learning students and what we do uh, for online learning faculty. This just says uh, uh, the kinds of things that our, our uh, team does uh, to support uh, quality education online. And this is uh, probably the central thing that has to do with not so much with service uh, to students and not so much with service to uh, the faculty, but this is at the core of uh, what we believe uh, is essential for a quality online experience. And that is uh, training for the faculty in pedagogy, uh, training for the faculty, faculty in how to deal with the uh, various bundle of software and uh, elements of things that are necessary, uh, how to run through a course uh, with the faculty member by storyboarding their, um, uh, their curriculum, and then how to build an online course. Uh, I don't have a slide, and I should have, I, I now uh, uh, feel uh, um, neglectful uh, that uh, you, I should have shown you a course uh, about how, how we do it. Uh, it's, not, uh, it's not a mystery. It, usually a course, uh, I'll just explain what a, a standard course is uh, at, uh, at, the, at the engineering school. If this is not a course that you'd find elsewhere. Uh, we are, we, we uh, pride ourselves in, in um, uh, providing a course that we uh, believe is a totally an engaged course with the student. We call it active learning. And uh, it's a combination of uh, very quick, maybe 10 minute videos of lectures, uh, often in front of a green screen, uh, sometimes in real classes, and then followed by a quick, uh, uh, maybe a uh, couple of minutes of uh, exploration of what that is, either in an exam or a quiz or some other interactive mode. And then something that the student does on the screen, usually by pushing things around on a screen, uh, clicking something on uh, the keyboard, uh, and doing all kinds of things that alert the students to engage in something, uh, not just reading and being passive, but actually participating in something on the screen or some voice or some activity, or actually doing an activity. And then it's often followed, something like that, by a discussion, uh, often a real-time discussion, sometime uh, through, a, uh, uh, through a webinar or through streaming video, uh, and sometimes uh, through uh, written discussions in a uh, forum. So uh, I usually, uh, if you would think of a course as 
uh, an hour-long discussion, an hour-long uh, lecture with some discussion. Uh, ours is entirely the opposite. Uh, there's nothing an hour long. There's nothing more than maybe five minutes or ten minutes. Uh, and the, uh, the demand uh, on the part of the faculty member or on, on what's on the screen is for the student to be constantly uh, urged to do something, to participate in some way, either by voice or by writing or by clicking or by touching the screen. Uh, and... Uh, uh, I'll show you some of the results uh, that are pretty astonishing uh, for, uh, for online learning and how this, this active learning approach, which has, has a theoretical background that goes back uh, to the turn of the century with uh, progressive educators uh, uh, who uh, encouraged active learning as the backbone of, um, of quality education. Uh, uh, I don't think I should go through uh, any, unless anybody wants me to uh, go through any of the other items. Um, I won't, I, actually, I won't, uh, I won't do this either. Uh, this is our um, partnerships that we have with uh, professional societies and um, uh, corporate corporations where we provide uh, education and training to Fortune 500 companies whose uh, employees need a master's degrees or other things in uh, mostly in cybersecurity, but in other fields as well, bioinformatics and so on. And uh, we have alliances with um, not only with uh, Fortune 500 companies, but with uh, uh, professional societies like um, IEEE, uh, ASM, who announce our programs to their, to their members uh, because they believe that what we offer uh, provides their members with uh, advanced education and training that is necessary for them. Um, one of the things that uh, Eric has uh, uh, insists upon and that is you, you, you ask the students uh, whether they like what they have uh, and uh, He's been, he's been doing this uh, for many years and is probably the leader in uh, finding out um, student satisfaction as a key uh, to whether online learning is actually working or whether on-campus learning is actually working. And you'll see from these charts uh, that we're pretty good from the point of view of uh, a student satisfaction. Uh, our credit-bearing courses, this is on average, uh, our students uh, say uh, about 80% of our students say that uh, they're highly satisfied in one way or another, either excellent or very good. And only about 20% uh, are dissatisfied. This is a very, uh, I don't know um, what your uh, data on average show. Is this uh, uh, common or... Uh, uh, Eric? The students in Rochester are very pleased with what we do. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the, what, did the, what does the literature say? Um, the literature, I think, would say that um, quality, if we think about this as it relates to quality, yes. that quality is not inherent in any particular mode of instruction. And so you can have students be very satisfied and having a great experience in an online course or not. And the same thing applies to our traditional face-to-face -face classrooms too. I agree. And the same thing shows for our own, uh, that on the whole, our uh, non-credit programs, this is mostly from Scientific American, uh, shows that our, uh, yes, please. What's the percentage of students who respond to that? Do you mandate it in order for them to get a grade, or is it purely elective that they? It's elective. I think the uh, the rules of federal um, uh, guide you that you're not uh, that students are not required to fill out these forms. So what's is, your what's your hit rate? Is this part of a course evaluation? It's or part of course. Standard? Yeah, it's but a separate instrument. It's part of. Yes, but they're not required process. to fill this out. But you still probably have, do you know what your percentage response rate is? Uh, 
The most recent one that we did uh, this last fall was 38% response rate. We're trying to get it up even further, but I think 38 response should be uh, sufficient uh, statistically. Uh, this is uncanny, always. Uh, there's a, I think there's a website called the uh, uh, No Significant Difference Effect that you can look up. And what it does, it has all the literature that shows uh, how online learning and uh, on-campus education, uh, the, the, the results are uncannily no significant difference in terms of outcomes. And this shows it, this, this, uh, uh, this is your experience. This is our experience as well. Uh, it shows, uh, as you can see, uh, almost uh, equal distribution of grades. And this, this was the, uh, I think, 2015 uh, grade distribution. Uh, but this chart I could pick up from any <laughs> Bless you. Thank you. Any previous semester, any previous year, and you could not tell the difference. Uh, uh, and this is, I think this is the most telling feature of our program. 96% um, completion rate of courses, and that's uh, one of the highest uh, in the uh, American education system. 89% uh, graduate from our master's degrees. The national average for STEM master's programs is 66% on campus. 20%, uh, this is the rest of it, is 20% average increases in, in enrollments year after year. Uh, 75 growth program over 10 years, 10,000 enrollments, which we've seen, 130 re unique courses. Uh, at the rate of 10 new online courses a year. And this is also very telling. We believe that active learning, what I described before, provides incentives for both faculty and students to pay tremendous amount of time to their online course. They actually devote, we believe, we haven't done the study, that's a study we should do, uh, how much time faculty and students devote to active learning courses online. Uh, 15 hours, we believe, is, is an extraordinary number. We don't have any results. To, yes? Is that per course or is that? Per course. Per course. Um, and uh, uh, one of the highest uh, the numbers that we think of in terms of faculty satisfaction is that 95% of our faculty return to teach uh, semester after semester. Uh, for, for me, the top two numbers are the most telling in terms of quality and in terms of effectiveness and uh, in terms of um, outcomes that 96% uh, course completion rate and 89% uh, graduation rate. Uh, this is a uh, self-promotion here now. Uh, uh, we are number eight on U.S. News and World Report uh, uh, graduate education online. Uh, we've been in the top 12, top dozen for the last four years. And uh, uh, Srini, the, the, the man who likes me to be on, on Coursera, uh, uh, doesn't like number eight. And he wants number one. And uh, we'll, we'll try as much as we can to be number one, but it's going to be a struggle. There are a lot of good schools up there. And uh, so uh, this award, uh, the uh, Ralph E. Gomery Award, we just won uh, a few weeks ago in Orlando. And um, it is uh, the highest honor you can uh, achieve uh, for, an, for an institution at the uh, it used to be the Sloan Foundation, and now it's the Online Learning Consortium. And um, uh, it is a, a proud moment uh, when we picked up that award uh, uh, a few weeks ago in Orlando. Um, it's named after Ralph uh, Gomery, uh, who some of you may know uh, for many years was the um, head
head of research at uh, IBM, and then uh, when he uh, retired from that position, became uh, the president of the Sloan Foundation. And he had the vision 20 years ago uh, that uh, anytime, anywhere learning was a possibility because of the internet. And it was through his vision that the Sloan Foundation supported online learning um, uh, over many years until a few years ago uh, and invested $80 million in uh, su supporting uh, schools like uh, NYU and um, uh, Stevens where I work and others, uh, others uh, to uh, stimulate an interest in online learning. And it was, it's in honor of him uh, that uh, this award was given and we're very happy. Um, questions? Yes. Yeah. Um, so did you guys build your learning management system? To no, we system use the learning management system that uh, NYU uses, which is called NYU Classes, mm -hmm. and it's a version of Sakai. It's an open source. Uh, uh, I'm of two minds about um, <coughs> building your own uh, learning management system versus using a vendor. Uh, because uh, in, in this environment, uh, after so many years of, of a trial and error with various vendors, the learning management system, uh, systems, in my view, are like Coke and Pepsi. Uh, the, the differences are marginal. And so uh, I wouldn't uh, worry too much about uh, introducing a, uh, one with lots of bells and whistles, because it, eventually they'll all have bells and whistles. And you can plug in new bells and whistles to most of these, or uh, your, your ability to put in uh, webinars or other kinds of uh, um, uh, applications uh, simply now is, uh, is easy. So uh, uh, I, d I don't think uh, uh, the learning management system is a, is a key element any longer to advanced uh, online learning. Yes. Two questions, actually. What kind of tuition do you charge for these? It's the same tuition as on campus. There's no difference. And we chose that uh, as a strategy. Uh, we felt that if we uh, lowered the tuition, uh, that uh, the perception of our uh, online core program would lower, be lowered. And so we wanted to maintain the same perception as the same high quality. And there's no discounting? There are discounts to, uh, if you saw that other, to uh, uh, members of those societies. They're a member of, if you're an employee in one of those uh, Fortune 500 companies and so on, uh, there are, there's a scale of discounts. Can you say roughly what percentage of your $10,000 endowments came from partner? 15%. 15%. 85% is open. Yes. Yes. Back to your Coursera classes, do you use any, do you have any of them that are free to try to garner enrollments into the online program? We don't have Coursera yet, but we, uh, we will uh, follow the Coursera model of allowing uh, uh, anyone who wants to uh, enroll free. Yes. In terms of faculty, and do you have separate online faculties, and some of these are completely separate degrees, or? Uh, most of the degrees uh, are not right. separate. Okay, so they're parallel. We have degrees online, online and on campus that are uh -huh. the same. Uh, and the content is the same, and for the most part, the faculty is the same. Mm -hmm. However, we do run into trouble uh, when we have multiple sections online, because oftentimes, mm -hmm. Um, enrollments uh, online uh, are greater than enrollments on campus. Mm -hmm. And so when we may have uh, one section on campus, uh, we may have uh, four or five sections online. And so maybe the faculty member who's teaching that on campus one cannot then, so we, uh, we struggle with that. Uh, mm -hmm. And we struggle with, adjunct, with hiring adjunct faculty and so on. Uh, but because uh, we're luckily in fields that are uh, very dynamic uh, and very much in demand, uh, like cybersecurity and uh, bioinformatics. Uh, it's uh, much easier for us to find capable industrial experts uh, who teach for us uh, as adjuncts. 
or as industry professors. We call them sometimes industry professors. Mm -hmm. And so we hire them. As a matter of fact, uh, it's embarrassing. Uh, if, you, if you're a, uh, a faculty member from Cisco or a faculty member from um, Facebook, mm -hmm. your, your class closes out in seconds, <laughs> whereas the faculty member on campus takes weeks yeah. for the, to close out. <laughs> so our, our star performers are, not our only, uh, are usually not our own faculty. Our star faculty are from Facebook and Google and, so, and places like that. Yes? So what fraction of your courses are being taught by contingent faculty versus full-time non-tenure track versus tenure track? That's a good question. Uh, it's about the same as on campus now. Uh, it used to be, we used to have uh, a greater percentage of full-time tenured faculty, faculty teaching on, on, online, but as we grew, uh, we ran into the, the problem of uh, not having sufficient number of faculty to teach online. So uh, I think it's now about 60% uh, tenure track uh, and full-time faculty and 40% uh, non-tenured uh, and, uh, and um, contingent faculty. But, you know, nationally, uh, the numbers are terrible. Uh, yeah. Ten years ago, uh, it was 79% uh, full-time tenure track faculty uh, who taught at the nation's universities. Today, it's 39%. So it's a, it's a, it's a sinking ship. Depending who you ask, it's slower than that. Pardon? Depending who you ask, it's lower than that. And the AAUP is giving numbers in the high 70s for a fraction that are contingent nationwide at this point. Yeah. I, I just uh, did a, a research paper on it, and that number was about a year old. So it could be. Yes? Uh, do students go through a formal application process? Yes. They don't apply to us. They apply to the department. And there's a blind um, admittance procedure. The faculty do not know whether they're admitting online or on campus students. The, yes. requirements, um, the requirements are, are identical to yes. the on campus version. Of course, they don't know. It's, the, it's a blind process. Yes? Um, in terms of things that you've learned, you know, lessons learned about teaching online even and how different it can be. You know, what are the biggest takeaways that you've had so far? Just what have That's folks learned really overall? That's a good question. Um, I think the biggest takeaway is being able to re-think um, your class mm -hmm. uh, in, uh, in ways that you hadn't thought of uh, before. The transformation from uh, lecturing or, or even uh, seminars to an online class uh, is like being in a foreign country, uh, learning a new language and a new culture. And so um, what most faculty say is that uh, they didn't realize that it was very important uh, to engage the faculty, consist, con uh, engage students uh, mm -hmm. constantly. Mm -hmm. And so the, the, the transformation of uh, uh, from a passive uh, student body to an engaged student body is, I think, the key transformation. And it's, it's astonishing that uh, it's taken online learning to give us that lesson, because that lesson should be taught uh, on campus as well. Do you find it spilling over into your on campus? Yes, I think those who teach online uh, say that they, uh, the lessons learned online are, are uh, translated on campus. Okay. Well, um, Mike, you want to take the last question? Well, this is mostly completely online type stuff. Um, are you doing blended uh, classroom type things, the classrooms and various other types of things? That, uh, uh, the university is. Uh, my school is not. But we're thinking of doing uh, low residency programs. Uh, where we would have uh, a piece on campus and a, and a piece online. 
Uh, but for the moment, we don't do that. Other, I, I think I mentioned that the Stern School has uh, low residency programs all over the world, and then they uh, intermix that with uh, online courses. All right, that's great. Um, th I want to be respectful of everybody's time. We're actually a little bit over here, so let me uh, ask all of you to help me um, in thanking Bob for coming here today. <laughs> Appreciate it.